But let's talk about reading the emotions of the market while embracing your own. Lately, a couple of you guys have been talking about the Mark Douglas videos on YouTube, and I watched those along with you, and they're pretty good stuff. And uh, big fan of Mark Douglas. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. And as I've said a thousand times, we were supposed to be on a project together once, and it never came to fruition. And I was kind of bummed out about that and kind of bummed out in hindsight that I didn't make something happen. I guess at the time, you know, it goes, you think, oh, well, it, there's always time. And, and sometimes there isn't. So if you get a chance, take it. <laughs> anyway, one thing he talked a lot about is how you may have an edge when it comes to the market. And I'm going to flesh that out in a few minutes. But on any given trade, that edge may not work. And that'll make more sense in a minute too and i think that the what you have to wrap your head around is the emotional nature of the markets and the emotional nature of yourself and i have plenty of examples of how emotional i am as i often say trading in a nutshell is at least with technical analysis is reading the emotions of the market participants while at the same time embracing your own as I've said a thousand times, once I started learning a little bit about neurology, I realized, you know what? We can't eliminate our emotions. If we had no emotions, we'd be institutionalized. And I've talked about that quite a bit in the past. So what is an edge? Well, your edge is the patterns and setups that you have deemed repeatable. Certain conditions in the market where you know what usually happens or maybe often happens afterwards is a certain thing. Now, the thing is, your edge cannot be defined in terms of statistics. If it could, you would own the world. And the example I often give is casinos. Casinos, especially in the big dollar games, have a very tiny edge. It might be less than a, less than 1% in some cases. But they know over time they're going to do just fine. There's going to be some losing streaks here and there, but overall they're going to do just fine. And it's a trillion or multi-trillion dollar business because of that. People come into the trading service and they say, Dave, what can I expect? I tell them, I don't know. Because I don't, okay? And neither do the, the gurus on YouTube that claim they have it all figured out. Believe me, they don't. There's too many variables, as I'll talk about it in just a few minutes. So I tell them when they ask, what can I expect? Well, if the market goes up in an orderly fashion or down in an orderly fashion, which is less likely to happen, right? Then you'll probably do pretty good. If it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, and at the end of the year, it's up 20%, but it dropped 15 and 20% and went up 20 and 30% in between then maybe I didn't do so well. So it's really hard to tell people what to expect, but I'm confident enough in my methodology. And more importantly, I know my methodology is conceptually correct, which I'm gonna beat the dead horse on a little bit in a few minutes. So I'm confident enough that longer term, everything is going to be okay. So your edge must be conceptually correct. I'm going to show you a pattern here that's conceptually correct. I borrowed that term from Larry Connors years ago when I did a little coding for him. Every now and then I'd come up with a system by accident or whatever, doing my own research or taking the taking his research, taking the ball and running with it. And if I'd show Larry, if it wasn't conceptually correct, we would toss it out. Now, let's get back to what happens in markets. Markets go up. Markets go down, and sometimes markets just go sideways. As I said, ad nauseum, show somebody the slide, they go, duh, right? Okay, but what happens when the market's going down and they don't want it to go down? They reason why it should be going up, or they start making up excuses, and they might have selective perception or perceptual distortion, like I talked about last week. By the way, my F, I had my trading shirt on earlier today. It's my F-bomb shirt and my uh, 
my wife's like, leave it on for your uh, webinar. I'm like, all right, let's throw a coat on. And she said she was joking, but I thought it would it would kind of uh, dovetail nicely or, or work nicely with tonight's presentation, especially about the frustration and psychology of the market. But anyway, very hard to see what is. And if you think about it, and one thing I've been think, thinking about a lot, and I've written a lot about this, I haven't published it. I need to get, I have tons and tons and tons of notes. I, w I wake up every day, like I said, at nausea, and I write three handwritten pages, and sometimes it's total crap. And sometimes I come up with something really good. And, and part of tonight's presentation came from that. So I guess you'd be the judge whether it's total crap or good. <laughs> But anyway, one thing that I was thinking of is if you're truly going to be a really good trader, you have to seek out the truth, okay? What is, is. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Is the market going sideways? And not to take anything away from an analyst from a technical standpoint, okay? From a, a technical analyst type of analyst who doesn't trade because in some cases they might actually make better analysts because they're not watching their funds dwindle in a trade and maybe not seeing the market clearly as we talked about again last week at the last week at van camping so if the market is going up there's obviously demand for the market that that's all you need to know okay you don't have to know about the situation in nigeria or any of this other stuff okay and the media will make up shit <laughs> after the fact. I guess I'll just demonetize my video. I don't care. We can talk about shit coins a little while anyway. But the media will make up stuff that kind of fits a logical narrative. And I actually, I have a, a one of you guys put a little post up on Facebook. I'll show you that in one minute. It kind of dovetails in with all this. But sometimes markets go up and sometimes markets go down and sometimes they go sideways. Now, it's either supply, demand, or equilibrium. And that's all you have to wrap your head around, okay? Everything else is just details. Now, what causes demand? Well, I thought I would do a presentation without quoting Tom McClellan's mother, late mother, Marion. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. But her point was that everybody uses timing in their investing. And I think... You can almost boil it down to just having money and needing money, right? So demand is people have money. One thing I was thinking about this morning is we had this great bull market and these crazy, crazy, crazy speculative stocks. And it was a lot of fun trading them. And the reason that happened was, and, and somebody, I think at Facebook pointed out, when I say Facebook, I'm talking about Dave Landry's trend traders. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit and how to join. But anyway, Somebody was pointing out, I think in the group, that the assets of Robinhood swelled during the pandemic. And what happened is, I, I don't know any professional trader that uses Robinhood. Nothing against Robinhood. A, a buddy of mine got in touch with me about a year ago. He's like, hey, my son's messing around with this Robinhood thing. Another friend recently asked me, ironically, same thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's great because it gets young folk into the market. Young folk. Whippersnappers. <laughs> But eventually, you got to make the turn and go to something maybe a little bit more professional. Now, maybe that's not fair to say, but I'm just thinking about like these kids just on their phone trading, and I call them the phone traders. I think you have to kind of graduate to something a little bit more substantial than that. But anyway, long story endless, Robinhood assets swelled because the government was giving out the stimulus money, and like if... I don't know if my daughter got any, but but I know that if you were like my daughter in college, where your rent is paid, your food is paid, you got a part-time job, and you're getting all this, so you don't really need more money, at least for your expenses. You want more, but, and a lot of parents obviously take care of their children in college, and these kids were getting this money, and instead of blowing it, which I think is great, they traded it, and, you know, crypto went up, and all kinds of things went up, especially the more speculative stuff. So they had money. You might be feeling good about yourself, the market, and just in general. And, and that's one of the things you have to be careful of if you're in a really good mood. 
sometimes you might just kind of throw caution to the wind. My biggest losses usually come after an international business trip or even a national business trip. But I go travel the world back before Corona, obviously, and come back feeling like God. You know, I haven't really had a, a dud trip yet. Thank God. I've made some mistakes along the way, believe me, that I regret. But overall, all the trips have turned out really well, really good, really well. Anyway, so I come back feeling good. And, you know, I'm Dave Landry, and first thing I do is lose a bunch of money. Now, the reason, especially like on an individual basis, stocks go up, is the promise of the future. And sometimes, let's say the stock market overall, it might be where else you're going to put your money, you know? Everything else is going down, might as well put in stocks, stocks going up. At least they were. We'll get to that in a minute. But when I did my IPO course, the reason IPOs go up a lot of times is based on the promise of the future. And the reason you buy a stock, even though the valuation is just crazy, and I'm not going to talk about funny minerals, don't worry. But the reason you would buy it is because you think down the road, something good is in the pipeline or something's going to happen if you want a fundamental trader or something like that. But then if you are just a plain old trader, you see the trend and you think, well, some greater fuel fools will come along and this stock is in demand. I better jump on board. So that's all a fear of missing out, the FOMO. Now, why do people sell to create supply? Well, obviously, instead of having money, they might be needing money, obviously. Okay. They might not be feeling good. They might be feeling bad. And by the way, if you think about it, you could just you could just think of little microcosms along the way, okay? Think about the guy out there that has a million dollars saved for retirement, but has that million dollars in the market. And the market starts going down. Now he's got 900,000, 800,000, 700,000, 600,000. At some point, he's going to have to really look hard and decide whether or not he needs to get out of the market. That has nothing to do with the market itself. And I didn't want to get into sentiment too much tonight, but basically, I guess I am talking about sentiment in some cases. You can't trade off of sentiment, okay? Because there are some that claim you can, but you can't, okay? Like, oh, the. The, the bullish sentiment is is whatever you know. You can't claim it, you can't trade off of that because sentiment's always going to be great and super high as the market's going up, and it's going to go up even more. I mean, if anything, you can almost use it as a contra. But if there was a way to kind of measure sentiment in general, and I guess there is, you look at the price, right? And if price is falling, then the sentiment is negative. If price is rising, then the sentiment is good, and that's where they get these big old high numbers for the quote unquote sentiment, which I think is a bad way to try to trade. But how do people feel about the market, right? Now, the promise of the future, concerned about the future. Now, I'm kind of flip-flopping between individual stocks and the overall market, but it doesn't matter. Right now, I think people might be a little concerned about the future. We've been putting off inflation for the last 20 years, somehow keeping it tamped down, and all of a sudden, it's beginning to rear its ugly head. So a lot of people are concerned about that. Distant relatives are starting to call me up looking for alternative investments other than stocks. So instead of FOMO, like the gentleman I was using as a microcosm earlier, I think there's a fear of additional loss. Now, if supply equals demand, everybody agrees on where stock prices should be. So if everyone agrees, longer term at least, there is no market. And it reminds me of Yogi Berra who once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And that's very true. Well, if the market wasn't emotional, it wouldn't be. 
it wouldn't exist, right? And a lot of this is coming straight from trading full circle. I'm gonna have to put that on sale at some point in time. And it's good stuff, if I say so myself. I draw heavily from it in these presentations, as you probably know.